The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerizines, which is opposite Galilee. And as he stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he lived not in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beseech you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and fetters, but he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them leave. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told, how, uh, told them how he had been possessed with demons was healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerizines asked Jesus to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but he sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your powerful and lasting word, which has been passed on from generation to generation and now read in our midst, we pray that word would be like a seed planted in the ground of our hearts. We pray that you would help us open our hearts, our minds, our very lives, so that we might receive your word, know your will, and by your spirit have strength to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Do you ever wonder why stories are in the Bible? I mean, today we make copies of almost everything, and it, it's non-significant, you know. We, we have emails, we have text messages, we've got blog messages, we've got uh, papers that we're reading online. Uh, pa paper doesn't mean anything. But in those days, it was very expensive and very significant. Whether you were writing on papyrus or vellum, some animal skins, this was not a small thing to be doing this. Now, there are some stories that it's evident why we as disciples of Christ would have those stories there. I mean, what would the faith be without Good Friday? I mean, we need to know about that, or Palm Sunday, or Easter, of course, or Pentecost. I mean, the whole book of Acts is a follow-up to the Gospel of Luke. So it's talking about Jesus, but it's also talking about us. So there are really significant things that we learn about by reading Scripture. And then there are the other stories. Stories like the one today. I mean, I would expect that you, like I, try to identify with people in the story. And the question is, do we have any connection at all to a crazy guy? I mean, this guy is certifiable. If this person were around today, multiple personalities... Yeah, we're way beyond multiple. We're, we're into the thousands. A Roman legion has 6,000 soldiers. Mark says the swine that ran over the cliff, uh, there were 2,000 of them. Now, now, 
I mean, I give a lot of credit to psychiatrists and psychologists, and they work with people. Uh, you know, I've never heard of anybody having this many um, kind of personalities, demons within him, as it would be described then. So why is it there? I mean, what, what's the point in telling us about this crazy guy? Oh, good for him. He got healing. But does that connect in any way 2,000 years later to a group of people who are, well, fairly sane? I mean, okay, sometimes I'm off the deep end somewhere, but, but really, most of the time, we get along and, and we're doing fine. I, I would like to suggest there are really four things, as I've looked at the text, and four things that really make a connection between us and this guy who is certifiable. Number one, he's a real guy. Now, now sometimes we, we forget that, that these are real people with real lives, and this was a real man. He was created by God. He was created like, like we were, with real intent, that there's something that we're to be about in the world, that in fact our purpose and meaning would be to identify what God has in mind for us. So it's not just the prophet that he knows while in the womb, God knew us before we were born. And he has a plan, and he had a plan for that guy. But it didn't get fulfilled. We would describe, having the rest of Scripture, uh, this as the impact of sin in his life. We know that that's what's in the mind of the Gospel writer by the description they give. I mean, it was a purient interest that the guy was naked. I mean, do you know any other stories? I mean, we even have Jesus. How long was he, na you know, a couple of, and then wrapped in swaddling cloths. Uh, you know, only at the end, sin at its finest, at its fullest, destroys the giver of life and takes away his clothes, dividing them up among the soldiers. But nakedness would remind the Jews who are reading this and ought to remind us of the time in the garden. There are Adam and Eve who are naked but do not know it. Everybody knows this crazy guy is naked. You'd avert the eyes of your children. You would stay away from anywhere he was. This guy is crazy, not able to serve anyone else, but scaring the bejeebers out of anybody he meets. Sin works in our lives, of course, so that we have this challenge and we see the impact it has in our lives. We are blessed in order to be a blessing to others. We've heard that before. You know, I, for years, growing up as a child, I, I have perfected a fake smile. You haven't seen it very often, but, but that's because my mother died, God rest her soul, and I don't need to do it anymore. But my mother had the first, maybe it was a pre-generation Polaroid camera. And the only time she took a picture took three minutes. And it wasn't three minutes waving the, remember when it came out and you'd have to wave it to dry it and have it uh, appear magically? Uh, it was not that. It was, it was about 30 seconds of that and two and a half minutes of smiling while my mother was looking at something. I have no idea why. Come on, huh? we're trying to get going here with the meal. The food's getting cold. My mother would stand there and take a picture. Do you know in all the years my mother did that, regardless of the generation of Polaroid she ever had, never once did I see her do this. Now, that's all I see now. Is that it? I mean, really. Have you, do you ever see your mother or father take a selfie? No. The focus was always there. When my mother and father went back and forth, snowbirds as they were, from New York to Florida, back and forth, my mother packed everything she needed in the car. Now, you'd say, how could she do that? Well, she only needed one thing. Anybody know what it was? Pictures of the kids. Albums that she carried back and forth never was away from them. The focus was always elsewhere. But the challenge for us because of sin is the, the focus comes inward. It's not just selfie. I take selfies too, with a little background of where I am to remember that because we're getting old. And anyway, whatever the purpose of the selfie, selfie, selfish, self focused. The nature of sin is to make something good or bad based on its impact on us. I was talking with the uh, uh, Bible study group this last week and just talking what kind of an impact that has. And my embarrassment, I've confessed it before. Uh, I wasn't a good student, didn't get my homework done a lot of times, didn't prepare for the lesson. 
uh, up until college, but in elementary school and in high school. And, and boy, I, I learned to pray on the bus going to school, saying, Lord, if we can just get through today, I promise I will do my homework when I got... No, none of you did, but I could teach you the prayer if you want. And, <clears throat> and sometimes that prayer was magically, mysteriously, mercifully answered. But I get there to class, and we're ready for a quiz or a test, and I hadn't studied, and I'm praying, and in walks God's gift, the substitute. <laughs> Not a clue. Did you ever have a substitute had any idea what was going on? You know, they would say, what's the subject? You know, we'd say French. You know, <laughs> no, just make it up. They had no clue. And we'd say, yes, there was a God. And the whole time I never once asked what happened to Mrs. Schmidt. I didn't care what happened to Mrs. Schmidt. I wasn't focused on Mrs. Schmidt. I was focused on me. I'm having a good day because that teacher up front has no idea what we're supposed to be doing. So if Mrs. Schmidt lost a loved one, if Mrs. Schmidt ended up in the hospital, if she got in an accident, if she, of all the possibilities why she wasn't there, never once occurred to me to give it a thought because I was having a good day. Sin will do that to us. Changes everything has the impact us, on us in our lives, and it impacted him. Jesus comes and heals him, casts out. When the people come, did you, what did they see? There were three things they saw. Instead of a crazy guy going nuts, naked, what did they see? Do you remember? There was a guy clothed, sitting where? At the feet of Jesus and in his right mind. When Jesus comes and touches us, when he comes and presents us, when he proclaims to us, when we sit at his feet and listen to this word proclaimed, we can have a right mind. We can be clothed. Heard that in the Galatians. What were we supposed to put on? Galatians lesson? Put on Christ. Now, that's Galatians 3, and Colossians 3 was a more extensive description of the clothes of a disciple of Jesus, what he gives us to put on in the world. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, Paul says, holy and beloved, compassion, have a passion with someone else, kindness, lowliness, meekness, patience, forbearing one another. If anyone has a complaint, another forgiving one another. As the Lord has forgiven you, you so must you forgive. And above all these, put on love. When we sit at the foot of Christ, he calls us to be the children and the witnesses to love in the world. That's how they're going to know you're my disciples. Not by the cross on your building, not by the cross on your ring, but instead by how you act. The love that you have, this divine love, is to be passed on to other people. So we have put on Christ, gathered here at his feet, to have our minds set on Christ. Secondly, this guy came from a real family. I mean, sometimes it touches us. You know, the, the, the mother and the, the husband who lost their child uh, down at, at Disney. You know, we, we, right away you're there. You're saying, oh my gosh, uh, we were down at Disney this last week, um, staying not, we didn't go to Disney, but we were there on the property, and we were up on the 11th floor uh, of a resort, and we've got our grandchildren. And I came out one time, and all the tables were turned up, and I say, oh, all right, you kids. And my, my daughter says, no, it's because they'll climb. I mean, all I could think of was what it, it would be like. You ever think about this crazy guy? Ever think about what his family thought? What shame they had in their own family or their own town? Who would talk to them? Anybody stopping by and say, hey, how's your son doing? Doing about the same crazy guy that he is? This guy was living where? Not in his home, but where? In the tombs. He's like a dead man. Nobody goes to the tombs. He goes to the tombs. The demon cast him out into the wilderness. All places that are apart, the impact of sin is to separate us. That's always included. Regardless of anything else that happens, whatever sin, when we choose to ignore the will of God, it separates us from him and from one another. And back to the garden, we've got Adam and Eve blaming one another, being separated from God, hiding behind the bush, cast out of the garden. 
This guy impacted a symbol of what sin can do has separated him from everyone. I was just reading some of the stuff about isolation. Uh, the prisons, when they were first done, it was a penitentiary. Remember the name? They used to call it a penitentiary. You know what they were expecting? Somebody to be penitent. That's why they did it. They put them in there. And so if they're going to be penitent, what do you need to do? What do we do in the midst of our confession? Silence. And so what they did was put everybody apart. They said, the way you're going to be able to come to grips with what you did wrong is to give you a year in silence. No connection to anyone else. No windows. One little hole in the, in the roof where the light could come in like the eye of God watching you. That's what they did. Read the history of the penitentiary system. Of course, what it made people was nuts. We, we need connection to one another. We need to be connected to people. And this guy is apart, and sin will separate us. And Jesus comes. Jesus is the one who brings a new connection to him, therefore a connection to others. That's what Christ is doing for us as well. We are the ones who are called to be the children of God and the disciples of Christ. And so healed, where does Jesus send this guy? You remember? home. Is that odd? I mean, that's such a small thing, except that it's the response of what happens when there is the gift of community. We have a new place to go, and Christ creates this new family of God. We are the ones who are given the gift of a community in Christ. We are the ones who are sent back home again. The Lord Jesus comes to this man and gives him a new life together And he is sent to do what? He is the one who is supposed to be the one who makes witness to what God is doing. He is the one who makes witness. That's an important part of his uh, gift that he receives, not just to receive it, but to share it with other people as well. Thirdly, this man is at war. He's at war within himself. He's got 6,000 demons within him, or perhaps 2,000 with three with split personalities themselves. He's struggling. That uh, war that's going on is something just in his life. Is there anything that we can identify in the midst of that? I don't know. How about St. Paul describing it this way from Romans 7? I don't understand my own actions. I don't do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. Has that ever happened to you? (laughs) Paul says, I can will what is right, but I can't do it. I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with my mind and making me captive to the law of sin. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, we we, we know, you you know, I know what's right. How come we don't do that? Paul senses the war that's going on, the struggle that will bring damage and uh, a a, a real destruction to his life. So this war that's going on inside, that man is going on inside, and when Christ comes, he heals the man. And the healing is what? A connection to Christ. This guy wants to stay with Jesus. To be connected to Christ is to be made holy and whole. Instead of a different personality, one to go to work, one with our family, one with our neighbors, one at church, instead we are made whole. So we have a connection to Christ wherever we go. Wherever we are doing something, it is to be done in the name of Christ. So Luther says, daily we ought to drown the old Adam and Eve in order that that new person come forth. Because we have been baptized into Christ. So now he lives in us. We live in him. Or as Paul dramatically says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the witness when the war stops and the service to others begins. Lastly, the attempt to control this guy failed. I mean, it wasn't that they didn't try. They put chains and fetters. Anybody know the difference between the two? 
chains would be what you put on the neck or the hands. Fetters go on the ankles. They don't want this guy showing up in their house some night in the dark. So they want to limit where he goes. They want to prevent him. But he would not be controlled. He breaks the bonds. He wanders wherever he wants. He will not wear clothes. So Paul says in Galatians that we have this custodian. Before faith came, before Christ came, there was a custodian of the law which says, here are the things you need to do. Here's what sin is showing up in your life as you go against that will of God. But one temptation for us is to look at those things and say, well, you know, what are the phrases you use? Times have changed. It's a different age. God understands. I compare my sin to somebody else's. It's not quite so bad. I basically uh, focus on mediocre sins, nothing too extreme, and that somehow God doesn't care about that. The law will not justify us. We try to make up for it by doing good things to balance the scales on what bad things we've done. None of that will work. We break ourselves free from the bonds from that custodian. But in these last days, Christ has come, dies for us, that we might be justified, made right by faith. And that's what John said was the reason he told the stories. I have told you these. Jesus did other things. Remember John 20? He did other things. But I've told you these in order that you might believe in Jesus Christ and secondly, have life in his name. The guy is sent back to his home. He's sent back to the community to tell what God has done for him. Can you imagine how different his life was then? What a witness he made. I would expect by the time this gospel is written, he's still alive. He'd say and tell the story in the community of believers, the power of Jesus to give new life. When somebody is downtrodden and wondering, can they ever get out of this rut they're in, they only had a look at him, and by that time they knew his name. And it wasn't legion. It was child of God, disciple of Christ. I pray the Lord would bless each of us. We look so sane. We are well-dressed. We get along in the world. But I pray that as we do, it would be as a disciple of Christ and a witness to all that God has done for us. I pray that for us all in Jesus' name. Amen. We take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.